On Point with Craig's Investment Partners. The information provided here is general in nature. It's not financial advice. It doesn't take into account your financial situation, objectives, goals or risk tolerance. All investments are subject to risks and none are guaranteed. So before you make any investment decisions, we recommend you contact an investment advisor. For more information about our services in that regard, you can go to our website, which is craigsip.com. Welcome to On Point. I'm Mark Lister, Investment Director at Craig's Investment Partners, and I'll be talking about a range of topics, including economics, portfolio strategy, investor education, and anything else that's happening out there in financial markets. Right, let's begin with a look back at last week, and it was another difficult week for most global share markets, starting with the US market. The S&P 500 fell 2.1% which means we've seen three consecutive weekly declines. And August has been a pretty difficult month so far, sort of two thirds of the way through. And the US market is down 4.8% so far this August. So that would make for the worst month since December last year. Now, not a huge surprise in some ways, uh, because August is a typically difficult period for Uh, global markets and July is typically quite a good month. So we did come off the back of quite a strong July and we've hit August and for a range of reasons. Uh, It's not just that seasonality, but that often does play a role. It has been a much more volatile month. If you were to look back at US shares back to 1945 and take each month of the year and look at the average return over all those you know, 70 or 80 odd years, what you will find is that the months of August and September are two of the weakest months. They're sort of in that bottom half of the list. And you've got uh, months like November and December and also July, which tend to be the stronger ones. And just, just worth reminding ourselves that this time of year is often quite a difficult time. It was last year, it's proving to be this year as well. That doesn't necessarily tell us where things will go or mean that it's a great buying opportunity because lots of other things going on in any given year, but it's it's important to note. And I guess the other point that I'd make is that in the last 10 months or so, we've seen a pretty strong uh, rebound from US share markets. Uh, in fact, from the end of September last year, Uh, through to the end of July, just a few weeks back, we saw a 28% return from the US share market, which is a a pretty hefty return. So we can't get too upset about a bit of volatility coming into the mix. That is is just what markets do. Uh, So that was the US. Uh, We look elsewhere, the UK market also lower, down 3.5%. We'll talk about that shortly. European shares down 2.3%. The Aussie market down 2.4%. And the local market actually held up a little better. You know, still down uh, 1.9% last week. That's the third worst week of the year. So it's definitely sort of uh, a rougher week than we've we've seen for a while. But um, we didn't fall quite as much as some of those international markets did. Uh, And on the local market, uh, it's obviously been the reporting season that uh, began last week. It'll continue this week, so if you look at the sort of best and worst performers, they pretty much give you a good feel for which companies so far this reporting season have produced the best and worst results. And uh, the one that was up most last week in the NZX50 was ScalarUp, rose 8%, so they had a good full year result, they beat expectations, Uh, they they needed to deliver a pretty strong second half of their financial year to hit their numbers, and they managed to do that, which is really pleasing. The industrial division was the key driver. Uh, the ag- agricultural division was was flat. Um, the balance sheet looks pretty strong. So, you know, it was a good performance from Scalar Up, which has come, come down quite a bit from its peak. It was very strong in terms of its share price last year. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we had Fletcher Building, which was down 11.5% last week. So that was... Probably the biggest disappointment uh, so far of the reporting season. Fletcher's did miss their their expectations, so they didn't quite come in where they were hoping to or where analysts were hoping that they would. Uh, The construction division, the residential division, both down quite sharply um, in terms of revenues, that is. The dividend uh, was lower than expected, 
and there was some news that the the first half dividend of the next financial year won't be imputed, which means you won't get sort of a tax credit, which means, you know, uh, if you're a taxpayer, most of us are, you'll have to pay a bit of extra tax on that. So that's probably not fantastic news for income investors. And they didn't provide any guidance, which isn't surprising, but it probably does uh, remind us that the outlook is quite uncertain. So that's how markets uh, all were. Emerging markets probably worth a mention too. Emerging market shares were down 3.3% last week. So, you know, worse than the likes of Australia, New Zealand, the US. And emerging market shares have fallen about 7.5% in the last three weeks. I think a lot of that is concerns over China. China's obviously a big part of that emerging market complex. And in China, you've got a weak economy, you've got a troubled property sector. Uh, the People's Bank of China, that's the central bank over there, they announced a surprise interest rate cut, um, which people didn't see coming, or at least not in the magnitude that, that it was. Uh, it was the biggest cut since 2020. It sort of tells you that they're a little bit nervous. Uh, and the the one fixing guidance, you know, the currency fixing guidance was, um, you know, the strongest that we've seen uh, ever, I think, last week. So those things, plus some other efforts that we've seen from authorities to try and bolster financial markets, uh, all of those things are a response to uh, a weakening economy and some concerns in the property sector, the shadow banking sector. Um, so China is definitely looking uh, a little bit shaky at the moment. And that is why, uh, that's one reason why you're seeing a bit of weakness across emerging market shares. Turning to interest rates, and uh, US Treasury yields increased for the fourth consecutive week. So the 10-year yield finished the week at 4.25, but it did go as high as 4.33 at one point. And apart from, apart from one day, uh, 10 months ago, one day where it pushed ever so slightly more than that, that's actually the highest we've seen uh, since no November 2007. So you may as well say last week, uh, the US 10-year Treasury yield hit the highest levels we've seen in 16 odd years, which is, you know, quite quite, uh, quite a stretch. So that is that is also playing into the volatility that we've seen. Interest rates going up, so bond prices going down and um, pushing equity prices down too, because higher interest rates aren't always fantastic for um, uh, for equity markets and some of the things that are driving all of these asset classes are, are affecting them all in the same way. The New Zealand five-year swap rate also rose. It was up 18 basis points to 5.05. So it's going up too. And it's uh, not quite where it got to in October last year. It got as high as 5.17% last October. That was the highest since 2010. So not quite at those levels, but it is certainly, certainly pushing up. The currency weakened further as well. It was down another 1% against the US dollar, uh, so fell to the, the lowest we've seen since November last year. However, the bigger falls have actually came against the British pound. You know, against the British pound last week, we were down 1.3%, and this year we're down 11.4% against uh, the British pound. So we're back at levels at sort of 46.5p. Uh, we haven't seen that since May 2016. And remember, it was that Brexit referendum in June 2016 that sort of saw the um, the pound uh, really tank uh, in the wake of that that decision, which was a little bit of a surprise. So uh, we, we've seen the Kiwi dollar versus the pound fall to levels that we haven't seen since before Brexit, you know, going back seven years or so. That's been partly due to some good news and and not so good news coming out of the UK. They had a solid GDP report, that's good news. They had um, a higher wage growth reading, which is good in a way, I suppose, but it does fuel expectations that we're going to see more rate hikes uh, than we previously thought. So you've still got a resilient economy, more so than expected in the UK, and you've got those persistent inflation pressures. So I think what that is doing is that is uh, increasing expectations of further rate hikes from the Bank of England, uh, and that is pushing the pound up, and it is weighing on the UK share market. Remember I said the UK share market was down 3.5% last week, which is a bigger fall uh, than we saw for, from all of those other markets. But if you're a Kiwi investor sitting here in New Zealand and you invested some money in uh, in the UK share market and wreck it, Ben Kaiser or you know, whichever 
business over there you've you've put some money into you've sort of lost on the one hand and you won on the other because while um generally share prices have been um been facing headwinds uh you will have seen a benefit in terms of the currency translation so it's there's lots of interesting dynamics going on across financial markets all right, let's look back at some of the key economic releases. And for a start, locally, we had some housing market figures. We had the July housing market report from the Real Estate Institute, and it gave us further evidence that the worst is behind us and that the market has stabilised. So while sales volumes were still down, you know, you've got, um, got a lack of listings, so you haven't got the inv inventory there to really drive activity, we have seen prices push higher. So nationally, prices were up 0.9% in July, and in Auckland, prices were 1.1% higher. So those those are the biggest monthly gains that we've seen since November 2021, which is really pleasing uh, for, for homeowners that they're not seeing uh, their biggest asset or what is, what is a very big asset for most of us um, fall further. And I think it's positive from an economic sentiment perspective as well. Uh, dairy sector, we had some more news on the dairy sector. This wasn't quite so good and um, it's quite ugly, to be honest. Headline prices at the GDT auction last week slumped another 7.4%. That's the biggest fall we've seen in several years, the sixth decline in the last seven auctions. Prices are now at the, the lowest levels we've seen since November 2018. So they're down 20% this year. They're about 47% below where they were in March last year, which was a 15 year high. And we saw Fonterra on Friday last week cut its milk payout forecast again. You know, it only did it two Fridays ago. So uh, in the space of two weeks, it has cut its payout from $8 to $7 and then from $7 to $6.75 at the midpoint. So from start to finish, you've got a decline there of 15.6%. And 6.75, that would be the lowest payout we've seen uh, in uh, five years, actually. So look, it's uh, it's not looking fantastic out there in the agri sector. I did write a, write a piece on this um, about a week ago, and I recorded a podcast on it. So if you want some more, more considered, more detailed thoughts on what it means, for the economy, for investors, for the currency, for the Reserve Bank, for inflation, uh, then go and dig that out. I won't dwell on it because you can go and listen to that to your heart's content. The OCR as well, this was the other big news, and as expected, the OCR remained unchanged at 5.5%, so everyone, everyone thought that would be the case, and there was no surprise. I guess what what was notable when you look through the associated uh, forecasts that came in the monetary policy statement is that uh, the the OCR track, so the forecast path of the OCR, uh, has been lifted slightly. So the um, the Reserve Bank is, long story short, they're not saying it's going to have to go up, but they have lifted it from where it is now. Uh, as an acknowledgement that there's a chance it might have to go up, you know, call it 30 or 40% likelihood. So I don't think we need to sort of panic over that. It's not unexpected. The economy has been a little bit more resilient uh, since they last um, released some forecast, forecasts. Uh, we've seen slightly stickier inflation, and um, they're, they're really just acknowledging, you know, that possibility. It's not forward guidance. It's not a, a prediction. So uh, for me, um, I still am of the view that we're at the top and that the OCR has reached a peak. And when I think about what's happening in the dairy sector and the flow on effects to the broader economy of those lower prices, lower payouts, I become even more confident about that because I think there are probably more headwinds uh, on the horizon than than people appreciate and that is going to give the Reserve Bank you know much less reason for tightening monetary policy if you get the usual sort of um, flow and effects as a result but uh, we can't rule out the possibility for you know more tightening uh, down the track so as always it's a watch this space and it will depend on the economic data again I recorded something on this last Wednesday afternoon. So if you want to hear sort of a, a quick fire 10 minute synopsis of what we what we got from the Reserve Bank, then just go back and take a look at that. The only other um, information we got last week um, in terms of economic releases was probably some more economic data out of China. We got the monthly indicators and they were pretty 
pretty depressing uh, for July. Not terrible, just but just dismal is probably the way to describe them. And uh, the Chinese economy is 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 starting to struggle at the moment. Domestic demand has been weak. Consumer spending's been soft. Um, they're also grappling with fears of deflation. You know, they've got that weak housing market. You know, the shadow lending sector uh, concerns. So, all put all that together, and they're starting to get a bit more worried about capital outflows. You know, uh, people taking their money out of China. So, uh, it's very much a watch this space. We will we will see more news, I suspect, this week out of China about. Um, action that the authorities and policymakers are taking to try and um, uh, add a bit of stability and optimism to sentiment and confidence across the Chinese economy. Right, looking to the week ahead, so it's actually a pretty quiet one when it comes to economic releases. We've got the flash PMIs out this week and PMIs stand for purchasing managers indices which are essentially activity indicators these will be for the month of august so one of the very first indicators we'll get for august we'll get the aussie flash pmi the, the reason it's called flash is it's sort of that's kind of the pre-release you know um these are based on surveys with businesses and uh they they release sort of an early edition where they haven't quite got all the responses but they've got you know 80 85 percent of the responses so you get that sort of early indication and it's um much more timely and uh yeah you sort of get the gist of things so they're they're, they're worth watching um even though they get revised sort of a week or 10 days later and the numbers might change slightly so the aussie flash pmi out on wednesday at 11 o'clock uh japan to follow after lunch and then the corresponding measures from Europe, the UK and the US that evening. So we'll, we'll be watching for lots of things. Um, last month, there was a real trend of slowing activity everywhere. Uh, and there was evidence that, you know, inflation was still quite persistent. And you had that big divide between manufacturing and services. So all of those things will be will be um, on on the agenda for keeping an eye on uh, midweek this week. We've also got um, the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium taking place. So this is sort of a central bankers conference. It happens every year uh, in Jackson Hole, which is in Wyoming in the US. So if you're in LA and you sort of go northeast, uh, you end up in Las Vegas. And if you keep going northeast, you end up in Salt Lake City, Utah, and just up from there, just a little bit further northeast, it's, I think it's sort of a, I've never been to Jackson Hole, but I, my understanding, it's a really nice place, a bit of a sort of ski resort town. Um, anyway, this, uh, this conference has been taking place every year in Jackson Hole since 1978, and it's hosted by the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. And it's, it's basically an event that focuses on economic issues, you know, central banks will go policymakers, academics, economists, and it's been um, it's, it's been a, a conference that has been closely watched because many former Federal Reserve chairs have used Jackson Hole to um, indicate quite important sort of developments or turning points in Federal Reserve policy. So that's why people get so excited about Jackson Hole. Um, so this week's event takes place uh, from Thursday to Saturday, and the theme is Structural Shifts in the Global Economy. So we'll have Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell speaking on Friday. That'll be Saturday our time. And this will be interesting. We've got, um, we've got the Federal Reserve with an upper bound of the Fed funds rate, which is basically their OCR, uh, at 5.5%, same as us. Will they go higher? Will they not? Um, hard to know. Uh, they next meet in late September, and markets don't think they'll make a move then. But you know, further down the track, um, markets are still, you know, wondering if they will make a move. The Fed has told uh, the market that they will do a little bit more, but you know, uh, that all depends on the data flow, and there's still plenty to come between now and late September. But it will be interesting to watch because you have got. Um, 
you, you have had people get quite excited about hopes for a soft landing in the US, you know, that we can get this inflation under control without a major rise in unemployment or without a major recession. And that's, that's I think, happened because uh, the headline inflation rate has fallen from 9.1% down to, you know, three or in the low threes. So that's, that's uh, been very encouraging. However, many of us are cynical that, um, or cautious is probably a better word than cynical, cautious that the next phase of the inflation battle won't be quite as easy because up until now we've been able to rely on uh, those easing supply factors, you know, oil prices coming down, um, uh, supply chains easing up, some of those sort of one-off COVID-related factors, um, closed factories, good shortages, a lot of those things have sort of uh, eased off. And from here on, it becomes more a case of getting demand under, under control. And in the US, which is still looking very resilient as an economy, and with consumers still having some pent up excess savings from the COVID area to spend, uh, that that it's, it's unknown whether, whether we'll need to see more economic pain and, and a, a reasonable rise in unemployment to get um, inflation under control. So be looking for some comments from Jerome Powell on that. Um, locally, uh, it'll be the domestic reporting season that is in full flight. We've got tons of market heavyweights due to announce results and um, every day is a busy day. So Monday, A2, Chorus, Freightways, Mercury, uh, through the middle of the week, um, you've got Sky City and Somerset and EBOS on Wednesday, Thursday in New Zealand, Auckland Airport, Sky TV, uh, Friday, um, Vector, Vista Group, uh, lots, of, lots of big companies reporting. So it's a, a very busy one uh, across the local market. Across the Tasman in Australia, uh, there's also plenty of companies reporting. Um, Westpac got a, a quarterly result. But uh, we've got interim results or full year results from the likes of BHP, Coles, Woodside, APA Group, uh, Woolworths, Ramsey Healthcare, West Farmers. So no shortage of companies to watch. And overseas, there isn't uh, a whole lot on the corporate calendar. However, the NVIDIA result will be very closely watched. That is on, on Wednesday. So that's... Um, uh, some people out there would think the NVIDIA result could be more important than, than Jackson Hole. Um, because NVIDIA has been such a market darling this year, very exposed to the AI theme and artificial intelligence, uh, which is why it's almost tripled in share price in 2023. So it's had a had a stunning run, and it'll be interesting to see whether their result can support that 200% rise in the share price and what they say about the outlook and whether um, all that excitement is justified. So... That's how the week is shaping up. Um, it will be in New Zealand, the reporting season. And uh, again, I recorded something specific to the reporting season uh, a week or two back. So you can go back and dig that out if you want to sort of hear more about the winners and losers. Uh, offshore, it will be that Jackson Hole Symposium uh, and that NVIDIA result, which will be worth keeping an eye on. So thanks for listening. As always, we'll leave it there and enjoy your... For more insights, visit craigsip.com.